So I'd like to uh, welcome you all back uh, to our program this afternoon. And uh, our first panel is really talking about the U.S. role in the liberal international order. And just to kind of um, let you know what the program is going to be, we're going to spend about the first half an hour um, with Secretary of Commerce Penny Pritzker and with Bob Kagan uh, from Brookings. And then after about a half an hour or so, um, we're going to let the uh, Secretary get to the important business of government. Uh, and then have two uh, Brookings Fellows uh, join us as well to continue the conversation. Um, it's really my honor to first introduce um, Secretary Prisker to you. Uh, and I have to confess, being a Chicagoan, this is just more evidence to me that the best people come from Chicago. Uh, Penny has been um, quite a public citizen uh, in many, many ways throughout her years. She was nominated and appointed by President Obama in 2013. And just to remind our guests, uh, the mission of the department is to foster, promote, and develop foreign and domestic commerce. She is a key member of the Obama administration's economic team. And she comes to the administration with over 27 years of business experience. She's actually run five different businesses in a number of fields, including real estate, hospitality, senior living and financial services. She's also been a public company board member for many years as well. During her tenure as secretary, she's engaged with more than 1,400 business leaders. About a third of the Fortune 500 CEOs have been directly engaged with her. And she really has begun a new initiative um, called Open for Business, which focuses on expanding trade and investment, unlocking government data, spurring innovation, and protecting the environment. As the U.S.'s chief commercial advocate, she really does lead the country's trade and investment promotion activities. She's traveled to many countries around the world. I think you'll find it interesting. She's the first Commerce Secretary to go to Burma from the U.S. And interestingly, fifth, the first in 15 years to go to the Middle East. Um, interestingly as well, prior to 1913, commerce and labor in the United States were actually one department. And um, Secretary Pritzker has actually made um, labor a very, very important part of her uh, dossier. And she is focused on workforce development and really kind of retooling of skills in light of kind of digital advances in the country. She's received a number of awards, probably the most significant, the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service. She's going to be joined by Bob Kagan, uh, who many of you may know is a senior fellow with the Project on International and Order and Strategy in the Foreign Policy Department. He's a contributing columnist at the Washington Post. He's written many, many books. The most recent one that was on the New York Times bestseller list uh, was called The World America Made. He serves on the Secretary of State's Policy Board, and he's um, co-chair of the bipartisan group on Egypt. He was a State Department staffer uh, in the mid-'80s. I'd like you to first welcome them both to the stage, and then we'll get started. Welcome. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Many visitors from both the U.S. and from abroad who are interested to hear your comments. And really, this is a very important year, uh, given it's the final year of the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. There are many critical economic initiatives on your plate, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership, mm -hmm. uh, and the G20. And we really would love to hear your perspectives on what are the most important issues on that agenda, um, what the priorities are, and maybe if you could give us some perspective, are those more strategic or more commercial, or do you really view them to be one and the same from a U.S. perspective? Well, uh, you know, on that list, obviously, uh, TPP is a high, high priority for the administration because that's something that it's our goal to get passed this year. Uh, TTIP, uh, Ambassador Froman's objective is to try and complete the negotiation by the end of the year, but obviously that's not something that could be brought to Congress with, by the end of this year. And the G20 is always an important engagement uh, uh, for all of us. You know, focusing a little bit on uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and uh, TTIP for a minute, B both are absolutely uh, of strategic interest to the United States. It's not um, 
And it's very important to our global leadership that we set the rules and standards for trade in the 21st century. The two agreements have different objectives. It, if you look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it's really focused on not only its access to markets as much as it is the rules of trade versus TTIP has a lot more to do with um, uh, uh, rules as opposed to lowering tariffs, because there aren't huge tariffs between our two countries. Um, but if you step back for a minute and think about trade and the importance of trade agreements and the economic benefits, I know are well known to most of you in this room. Um, you know, a quarter of our growth from 2000 to 2015 comes from our ability to export. And um, 11 and a half million Americans go to work every single day because their companies export. Uh, and their jobs depend solely upon exports. That's up to almost 2 million jobs from 2009. So it's not as though this isn't an important job creator for uh, the United States. Um, uh, what are we trying to accomplish with the Trans-Pacific Partnership? We know that 95% of customers and consumers are outside the United States. But with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we're trying to get our companies to have access to markets that are the fastest growing, uh, where the fastest growing middle class is on Earth. That the middle class in the Asia Pacific is going from about 500 million people to 3.2 billion in the next 15 years. So those are numbers. 15 years is something we can all get our heads around. And you know as business leaders and uh, leaders in your fields that if you don't have access to the, that kind of market, your companies will be left behind. And other companies will fill the void in creating products. And there's a real demand for American products, but we have trouble both with tariffs as well as various barriers to be able to sell our products. The second issue to keep in mind is it's not as though the Asia Pacific is sitting around waiting for this to happen. There's a lot happening. There, are a lot, there have been over 100 free trade agreements since the year 2000 that have been negotiated uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific region. And in fact, China is now working to uh, negotiate another free trade agreement, regional free trade agreement called the RCEP. So the question becomes, why do we say this is a strategic agreement? It's about who's going to set the rules of the road for trade in the 21st century. And then you ask yourself, well, what is the cost of delay? The Peterson Institute uh, uh, did a study that said that just even delaying one year will cost the United States about $94 billion. So there's a cost to us futzing around and not getting this thing done. Um, but the most important thing that a trade agreement does is allow us to shape our relationships with uh, uh, the, our 11 partner countries. Now, what does that mean? It means setting labor standards. It means setting environmental standards. It means ensuring access for e-commerce uh, products and services. It means protecting intellectual property or trade secrets or strengthening, frankly, our national security because what we do know is the more American commercial presence we have in a country, the better our relations are with the countries uh, that have such significant American commercial presence. So I know there's a lot of rhetoric out there about these agreements and about trade in general. And I know there's also anxiety among uh, some Americans about uh, uh, frankly, globalization and digitalization. But I think we've conflated matters. And trade is being blamed for things that, such as globalization, which is happening regardless of whether there are trade agreements. There are foreign companies that our American companies are going to compete with, whether we have access to those markets or not. Uh, automation is happening whether we have trade agreements or not. And that's creating anxiety both create anxiety for American workers. But trade agreements allow us to shape the engagement with these countries, to improve the relative positioning of the American worker, to ensure that there are minimum wages. And the other thing that we need to do in also to deal with this anxiety is to also make sure that we make sure that our workforce is trained for the jobs of the 21st century, which is why 
you mentioned very nice, very kindly that we've made workforce training a priority at the Department of Commerce. Again, is because what I've heard from the 2,100 CEOs that I've met with over the last couple of years is they all have trouble finding a qualified workforce. So TPP, TTIP, these are strategic agreements, very important for U.S. leadership on the global stage. Thank you very much for that. And, and maybe just to provide some context, um, Bob, you recently did a report for the World Economic Forum that really talked about um, America's role in the world and the so-called liberal world economic order. And we often focus on the U.S.'s security or military role, but many of us think that maybe the economic plank should be as important. And I wondered if you could just talk about what future you see for a liberal world economic order, especially when you view it in economic and military terms. Yeah, well, well thank you very much. I, you know, if you go back and look at what the the sort of founders of the of American foreign policy at the end of World War II were trying to do. They were they were trying to put together uh, a a liberal world order along several dimensions because as they looked back on the period of the 20s and 30s, uh, there was a breakdown of uh, of the economic system because countries were moving toward protectionism, including the United States. There was a breakdown uh, of democracy and there was a breakdown of security, and they understood when they were fashioning this new world, uh, when you know people who were present at the creation, that you had to have all elements of these things working together. That uh, you had to have a, a, a fairly open global economy, uh, which tended to increase interdependence and tended to, the, the general view is intended to decrease the likelihood uh, of conflict. That had to be bolstered uh, and undergirded by a security environment, because in, a, in the absence of security, you can't have that kind of uh, open economy. And these things work together. And I think that what people tend to lose sight of today, although unfortunately I think they're losing, many people have lost sight of the need to sustain this world order in general. I think they take for granted its, its benefits. But one of the things that we tried to talk about in the, in the World Economic Forum report was you need to be doing all of these things at the same time. You need to be extending uh, trade. You need to be providing uh, security. You need to be doing more in the way of exchanges. You need to focus on America's advantages in energy and put all these things together uh, as, as a way of as a way of supporting this international system, which uh, Americans have benefited so greatly from. And I think that's also what's been lost. Uh, people tend to take for granted all the good things and focus on the bad things. That's kind of your point about they take for granted the benefits of trade and they can only they want to blame trade for all the things that they're unhappy about. That's true of American foreign policy in general. Everybody's looked at, at the failures and the difficulties and in foreign policy there are always failures and difficulties, but they take for granted this sort of basic uh, structure of world order, which they probably, I would say Americans benefit from it more than anybody else. So. Our task, uh, you know, I'm just a writer, but people in the people who are political leaders, people in the administration, as we go forward, is to do more, I think, than we have in the past to explain what it is that's at stake, why we would suffer if we allowed it to collapse, and what are the elements that need to come together to, to keep it in place. Thanks for that. And Secretary Pritzker, I mean, trade agreements are one tool in our arsenal uh, in which we can help define the global economic order. But you really have increasingly deployed another, and I think you've called it commercial diplomacy. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about what you mean by commercial diplomacy and the role that you think the private sector should play in that effort. Well, if you, if you agree with the fundamental premise that one way that a country is judged, its strength is judged, you know, often by its military power, its diplomatic power, but it's also, uh, there's the commercial power that a country has. And, you know, a strength of a country is often measured by its economic strength. And as you, as we looked around the world and saw so many challenges uh, to access and barriers to American companies doing business, it became really obvious to us that there's an enormous asset our country has that's being underutilized which is the American private sector. Our commercial power is unparalleled around the world. It's diffuse in the sense it's all of your businesses, uh, but it is massive in its presence and importance, 
And one of the things that I heard over and over again from leaders around the world is we want American companies. We like the way they behave. We like the way they contribute in the communities in which they're active. We like the fact that they actually play by the rules. Um, and so commercial diplomacy is a pretty simple concept, which is that uh, if you consider, as we do, that the American private sector is a major asset when it comes to shaping policy around the world, that the US government and American private sector can go to, uh, can work side by side with foreign governments to help them understand the disconnect between the policies that they have and some of their stated goals in terms of foreign direct investment or greater economic growth. And it, um, it's proved to be a very effective way for us to demonstrate by working side by side and at times sitting side by side with American businesses, with foreign government leaders and our counterparts to talk about, look, here's a policy you have that is absolutely in contravention to what you're trying to accomplish. And you know what we see is, is that um, countries recognizing that they need to adapt because they recognize that they're competing for, uh, you know, there's a global race or a global competition for foreign direct investment and foreign capital. And the more enlightened countries appreciate that they need to address their policies to, to be more hospitable to foreign direct investment. And that's uh, why commercial diplomacy has, I think, such a, an appeal and has been such so effective. And it really leads to greater prosperity, not only in the countries that you're working with, but also back here in the United States because it creates economic growth, but it also leads to, I think, further to what Bob was saying, knitting our countries more together, and by doing so, you create greater um, impetus for peace and prosperity. Thank you for that. Bob, you know, thinking about these efforts, both commercial diplomacy and the trade agreements, um, when you look at the dynamics of the U.S. election cycle right now, so regardless of who wins the presidency uh, next for next year to begin, the rest of the world will have seen kind of the dynamics going on in our country. And I wonder whether you think that affects our standing in the world order, whether it's our private or our public sector. Well, right now it certainly is. Um, uh, the only thing we have going for us is that everybody else is a mess too. Um, and everybody has their uh, version of what's going on in this country. Certainly you can see it in Europe. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're not the only ones going through this difficulty. But yes, and it's, and I've, uh, had occasion to talk to uh, foreign diplomats, and the funny thing is, you know, uh, f 13 years after the Iraq War, uh, what you mostly hear from people is a, a, almost a panic that the United States is basically about to pull out. Um, it, one of the things we discovered uh, in preparing this uh, report for the World Economic Forum, we did, we held some discussions with thought leaders and political leaders in several regions of the world, and in one way or another, uh, every single one of them want, wanted more America, not less America. Um, I mean, we didn't hold one in China. They weren't begging for more America. But in Asia, in East Asia, there was. In Africa, there was. And one of the things, by the way, just to, to pick up on the Secretary's point, one of the things they want is American entrepreneurship, not just investment, but also the skills. There's a great demand, we heard a lot of this in Africa and Latin America in particular, there's a great demand for sort of American know-how uh, that they, it's not even government to government so much, it's just, um, it's people to people. But the, the general sense that uh, you need to have more America and when they see what's happening, and it's not just Donald Trump, it's, it's, it's Sanders as well. Um, and I think there's no question that American public opinion right now is to say the least in flux. Uh, if not actively turning against foreign involvement in all ways. So what will happen after the election obviously depends a great deal on who wins the election. Um, but even if I, the person who's sort of the more internationalist of the two candidates wins, even if uh, Clinton wins, American public opinion will not have changed that substantially. And there's a tremendous job 
moving forward by the president, because at the end of the day, only a president can do this. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had to work very hard to sort of gradually bring the American people around. The next president's gonna have to engage in that activity on all these issues, which is why it's unfortunate that in this campaign, uh, Clinton has had to come out against TPP because presumably she's gonna have to reverse herself on that and explain why. But the educational process that the president has to engage in is, is, is the biggest answer. Then I think the world will settle down. Um, but with the mood of the country as it is right now, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Madam Secretary, yeah, this is the mood of the country, but it's happening at a time when the emergence of the Asian powers, whether it's China or India, or other countries in the region, and also the kind of relative decline of Europe is occurring. And so um, it's reshaping patterns of international trade and investment and trade flows that we never would have seen historically, we now see. So given the geopolitical dimension and tensions out there, um, how do you think about advice to U.S. firms when they are, are proceeding with their investment priorities and in light of kind of where the administration thinks the priorities are? Well, I, I, what I would say is, is that just being, um, you know, geopolitically savvy is, it's necessary, but that's not sufficient. Um, you have to really, these are economies and governments that are evolving. And um, so you need to be an active participant, which puts a lot of pressure on a small business um, and also puts pressure on uh, all companies. But you have to get involved in helping to shape the environment. Um, you know, the emerging markets are very much in flux. Uh, and, you know, there's progress and then there's, uh, you know, things may go sideways in different markets. And each one is a different story. And, um, you know, obviously the first role of the American government is to focus on helping to work to create a political environment that is hospitable to American investment. But for a company, it's very important to engage in helping to uh, talk with the local governments about what are the challenges to investment in their countries um, or the challenges to entrepreneurship as you were talking about, Bob. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. We had the, uh, the president hosted the ASEAN Leaders Summit uh, in February. And we brought in the CEOs of Cisco and IBM uh, and Microsoft to talk with them about their policies. Because every one of these leaders wants more entrepreneurship in their country, more investment from those companies. But every one of those come, uh, but most of those countries have policies requiring data localization, or policies that are um, undermining e-commerce, or don't protect intellectual property protection. It's one thing for us as government to uh, point these issues out. It's another thing to talk also with leading. Uh, innovative companies to say, look, these are policies that are impeding precisely the kind of economies that you're trying to develop. And that's uh, what commercial diplomacy in action is. And you saw the leaders having very serious one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-one -on -one engagement with these CEOs to understand, well, explain that to me. Explain, you know, why do we need a bankruptcy code that allows somebody to fail? Uh, well, if you want innovation and you want entrepreneurship and you want people to be able to create new products, that first it needs to be easy to start a business, but it also needs to be easy to fin close a business if it's not working. And so explaining this uh, to the uh, leadership in different countries is very important role that American business has to play or can play and should play in addition to just understanding the landscape. Because as Bob pointed out, the landscape in these countries changes. It is not, it, it's not status quo anywhere. And again, speaking of non-status quo, I mean, we all know post-financial crisis, the world changed dramatically in terms of what the relative standing, not just of financial institutions, but the whole Western economic order. And I know many of you have gone to meetings post-crisis they talk about the Beijing consensus as opposed to the Washington consensus. And I just thought you might want to make some comments about where you think we are on that journey. Well, I'm not sure I'm equipped since I don't ever have any money to think about, really. So, but it, it, 
my sense of it is uh, we've 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 corrected back from the idea that China was was doing everything perfectly and we were doing everything wrong. Now, I, my guess is, although there are people in this audience who know better than I, and people sitting on the stage know better than I, that probably there's no consensus right now. That none of the consensuses are sort of dominant. But if one is, if one is, I think the U.S. is sort of back to being in a position where people think that system is, is, is sort of working better right now. I fear that there is a general crisis of capitalism in terms of public opinion that people, in the same way that, uh, you know, in the 1930s, people doubted whether capitalism really worked. We're not there, but I worry that sort of a lot of the things that we take for granted about what works in the system, I'm not sure the American public or lots of publics agree that that is true. But in, but in terms of the overall world situation, you know, well, I mean, even Fried Zakaria had to say that America is just back and, you know, it, it's not such a post-American world after all. And clearly, that, clearly that's the case. Uh, the American economy is doing better than most economies. And I don't see personally, again, I might not see it, a great desire to emulate the, the Chinese model. So um, I think we are pretty well positioned. Uh, you know, and this is the part of it that I find frustrating. I think we are actually quite well positioned to continue playing the general leadership role that we played in the past on the economic front, on the security front. It's really just a question of whether we want to do that. And uh, Madam Secretary, I know your time is very short today, but I just thought if you want to leave us with any kind of final comments, because uh, uh, I know you have to kind of get off the stage in a couple minutes. Well, I, thank you. But I, I think the last comment that I would make is to underscore this point. America does play an extraordinary role globally, and, and I've had the privilege in this job to be able to see it, having traveled to over 40 countries and having traveled multiple times a year to Mexico, India, China, and other places. And we should not, um, we should always be trying to improve our system, but we shouldn't forget the important role that we play uh, in, in trying to balance equities and do it in a way that is, is um, uh, not as coercive as many governments in the world. And I think that, you know, the fact that we have an economy that is as resilient as, as it is even if it's not growing as fast as certainly any of us would like at some moments in time. It is resilient. There is a lot of flexibility. We do have, we do run by a system of rule of law. And, and that we do, you know, our court system isn't perfect, but it's the best we've got in the world. And, and you know, we should not forget these assets that we have, our great universities, uh, you know, we have 19 of the top 25 universities in the world. And then we have the most productive people, uh, our workforce, of any of the developed countries, and certainly more than the undeveloped countries. So we've got extraordinary assets. The question is, do we have the capacity to come together, and do we have the will then to be play the kind of leadership role that, frankly, many countries want us to play? They don't want to be lorded over, but they do want a strong partner. Okay, thank you very much thank for your optimistic note, and thank you very much. And please thank uh, her for coming today. Thank you.